In times when Paul Harvey was too ill to record his broadcasts, we got to hear the rest of the story from its creator and sole author. Here's Paul Harvey Jr. Now, the rest of the story. It was the sort of thing Jamie's parents might have expected a dozen years previous, but when their 19-year-old college student son brought home the baby raccoon he had found in the woods nearby, Mom and Dad didn't quite know what to think. The raccoon had obviously been abandoned by its mother, Jamie explained. A trip to the local veterinarian revealed why. The little animal was blind. Jamie's folks agreed that the raccoon's predicament was very sad, but that, after all, was nature's way. Still, Jamie was reluctant to abandon the tiny creature in the woods a second time, this time surely to die. And so began an incredible family saga. The story of aggravation and tenderness and laughter and love that was bound to grow from sharing one's home with Kitty the raccoon. And yes, it all really happened many years ago, but it was not to be forgot by any member of the Stamper family, including and perhaps especially by Jamie's dad, Malcolm. Because when aerospace engineer Malcolm Stamper retired from his job at Boeing in 1990, he started thinking about the lessons in compassion he'd learned from his acquaintance with Kitty the raccoon. And the more he thought, the more he realized that they were lessons we all need to learn, and the earlier in life, the better. So Malcolm Stamper opened a small office in Seattle, his only full-time employee was his own daughter, Mary Lynham, and a little publishing company called Storytellers, Inc. was born. The publisher's mission was simple enough to reteach consideration of and respect for and kindness toward fellow beings, to encourage a gentler attitude toward all living things. If you want to get the guns out of the lunchboxes, Mr. Stamper exclaimed, put humane literature back in schools. And that is precisely what he did. With the redistribution of classics like Black Beauty and Beautiful Joe and the Albert Payson Terry Hume books about collies and more than a dozen new and original books promoting better treatment of animals, titles like Cousin Charlie the Crow and The Lost and Found Puppy, because Malcolm Stamper's dream was to teach literacy while teaching tenderness and compassion. Well, immediately law enforcement officials and sociologists applauded. For generations they'd traced much cruelty among grown men to their cruelty toward animals when they were boys. Seattle's reincarnation of St. Francis, Malcolm Stamper, died June 14, 2005. But his publishing mission presses onward. And its mounting success will always point back to the day that his son Jamie returned home from a nearby woodland, cradling in his arms a tiny, abandoned, and blind baby raccoon. And yes, as by now you've guessed, the story of Kitty the Raccoon, tenderly penned by Malcolm's son, was the first literary step for the Stamper family on an exciting path which may someday lead to a better world. But now, whenever you hear the name Malcolm Stamper spoken respectfully in publishing circles, you will remember the man who led 50,000 employees in the development of the first jumbo jet, the Boeing 747, only to set out in his retirement upon the most glorious quest of all, because now... You know the rest of the story. And now, the rest of the rest of the story. Malcolm Stamper was born on April the 4th, 1925, grew up in Detroit, and served in the Navy during World War II. Now, everyone called him Mal. He attended the University of Michigan Law School in Georgia Tech, where he earned a degree in electrical engineering. In 1949, he began working his way up into the higher echelons of General Motors. In the early 1960s, he began working for Boeing Aircraft Corporation. 1962, he was appointed as head of Boeing's Aerospace Electronics Division. Three years later, he became vice president and general manager of Boeing's Turbine Division. In 1966, Boeing CEO Bill Allen asked Mal, how would you like to build an airplane? In fact, 
the biggest airplane in the world. Mr. Allen, Mal replied, the only airplane I ever built had rubber bands on it. Mr. Allen's expression remained unchanged by Mal's apparent failed attempt at humor. Do you or do you not? He asked sternly. Mal recognized the gravity of the situation. Another joke like his first attempt and Mr. Allen would look to someone else. In all seriousness, Mal responded, I'd welcome the challenge. But Mal failed to realize just how big a challenge he had accepted. The future of Boeing depended on the success of the 747. The success of the 747 depended solely on Mal. It was his baby. One newspaper reported the 747 was an engineering and management challenge as monumental as the cavernous 400-seat plane. Mal and his team began the tedious task of developing the future jumbo jet. As his engineers worked on the minutia of the design, Mal had to think about the logistics of actually building a working model. Boeing's current factory was not capable of constructing all of the components necessary for a jet that large, nor was it large enough to assemble the jet. In Everett, Washington, Mal and his engineers designed and built the world's largest factory. When completed in 1967, the Boeing Everett factory covered 43 acres and was, well, about the size of 32 football fields. After several expansions, the Everett factory building now covers just over 98 acres. That's about the size of 74 football fields. It's the largest building by volume in the world. On September 30, 1968, members of the press and representatives of the 26 airlines that had ordered the jumbo jets gathered at Boeing's Everett factory and watched in awe as the first 747 was rolled out of the assembly building. After months of on-the-ground testing, the 747 flew for the first time on February 9, 1969. On January 15, 1970, First Lady Pat Nixon christened Pan Am's first 747 at Dulles International Airport. Rather than the traditional champagne, red, white, and blue water was sprayed on the jet. It's a shame this photo is in black and white so we can't see the colors of the water. On January 22, 1970, the 747 entered service with its first flight from New York to London. In the four years since he began working on the 747 project, Mal took just one single day off, one Christmas day. In 1972, Mal was named as corporate president and served on the board of directors from that year, 1972, to 1985. Almost as soon as the 747 entered service in 1970, the economy of the country declined into a recession. Many orders for the 747s were canceled. Boeing had no choice but to lay off almost two-thirds of its 101,000 employees. That's, that's nearly 67,000 employees who were suddenly unemployed. Mal remembered, the human suffering bothered me. We built streetcars and boats, formed a construction company, and even tried farming to bring back jobs, but we didn't make any money off of them. By the late 1970s, the recession had eased, and the Boeing's 747 was a resounding success. Mal retired from Boeing in 1990. Years into his retirement, Mal said, I get an emotional pull when I see a 747 fly. I go into a trance. It's still very magical to me that people could put all of the inanimate stuff, aluminum, copper, wire, rubber, and plastic, together and make it fly. Although I, Brad Dyson, understand the basic fundamentals of flight, it still seems magical to me too. How can that big thing fly? Now how does someone who managed over 50,000 people to build the world's largest factory, to build the world's largest jet, go from those Herculean tasks to becoming a children's book publisher? Mal and his wife Mary raised six children. Mary said, We had six children, so we read a lot of children's books. Their son Jamie, also an engineer, had written a book about caring for a blind raccoon named Kitty. 
Mal loved the story so much, he started the company to publish it. Mal was obviously a man who had no problem thinking big. Mal's company was called Storytellers, Inc. That's not I-N-C, it's Storytellers, I-N-K. Mal, Mary, and their daughter, Mary Lenham, led the company. Mal's wife was the editor-in-chief, and his daughter was the president of Storytellers, Inc. Because of the company's mission, they were able to get sponsorship from corporations including General Motors, Chrysler, Bell South, Woolworth, and Kmart. Chrysler Chairman Lee Iacocca saw the operation as an investment in tomorrow's workers. Lots of programs teach reading, Lee Iacocca said. Miles tries to go a step further and instill values like compassion and respect for living things. Now that's something we could all get behind. Mal often sent his daughter, the company president, to research publishing topics. I have to remind him that he no longer has 160,000 people working for him, she said. He just has me. At the time of Mal's death in June 2005, their company had published about 40 children's books, most of which were tales about animals for elementary aged children. Mal started a foundation called Operation Outreach USA and began raising money and donating some of his own money so the books could be given to school children. By the time of Mal's death, the foundation had distributed over 1.8 million free books. This may seem unnecessary and maybe insignificant, but illiteracy is still an important issue in America. According to the National Literacy Institute, about 79% of adults in the United States are literate right now, 2024. That means 21% of the adult population of the country are illiterate. 54% of adults have a literacy level below a 6th grade level. 20% are below 5th grade level. According to their statistics, the state with the lowest adult literacy rate was California. New Hampshire was the state with the highest percentage of adults considered literate. Now this is per capita. As far as children literacy, Massachusetts was the state with the highest rate of child literacy while New Mexico was the lowest. That's just shocking. Now another program which is working to help correct this problem is led by Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton's Imagination Library is a book gifting program, sort of like Mal's, which mails one free book per month to children from birth until they reach five years old. One book a month for five years. We always looked forward to getting our new Dolly book. That's what my son called them. It's a wonderful program. If you have children or grandchildren in that age range, from birth to five years old, or even if it's a few months early, go ahead and get them signed up. But be sure to get them involved. I'll leave a link to sign up for Dolly Parton's Imagination Library in the description. You know, I always enjoy learning about someone who changed the world for the better. Mal certainly helped in the way we travel, and he most certainly did in this program to help with childhood literacy. We can all make a difference in our world. We don't have to make a major change like Mal did. It can be a small difference, such as calling up an old friend on the phone just, just to catch up. We can all make a difference. Help someone. Do a chore for someone. Do something without the expectation of receiving something in return. What a wonderful world it would be if we all practiced that. Don't you think? I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And now you know the rest of the rest of the story.